What's going on, everybody? It's Thursday, August 11th, and this is the College Football Daily. I'm your host, Nick Costco, and we have another big episode for you today as we inch closer to the 2022 college football season. It's Michigan Wolverines time as the defending Big Ten champions are looking to repeat once again this fall and get back to the college football playoffs. So we're going to preview what's to come for Jim Harbaugh and company, and to help me do that will be Zach Shaw of the Michigan Insider on our 24-7 Sports Network. So let's bring him in now. Zach, thanks for joining me today, man. Michigan, I'm very fascinated by this squad this coming season. So first, I have to get your observations on what you thought of fall camp so far for Michigan as we are now just a few weeks away from the start of the season. Yeah, I think uh, there's a lot of optimism, at least you know within Michigan and obviously the fans. This is kind of the first time in really a decade that they entered the season without any negative energy about the previous season, you know, whether it's a loss to Ohio state or a bowl game loss. I mean, this is, they're coming off their best season since 90, 1997. Uh, but then they return a lot of players. There's obviously star players that they're missing, but a lot of excitement about the, the offense. They're still, they still need a quarterback, but I think there's a lot of excitement about all the, all the people blocking for them and the players are going to throw to. And then, and then the defense, you know, the coaches and players are, are raving about how deep they feel it is. They feel like every, other than maybe linebacker, every position is five, six, seven deep, or even last season when they had a lot of success defensively, it wasn't necessarily, a, there wasn't a second string. So I think there's, there's a lot of excitement. Uh, you know, Jim Harbaugh, his phrase is, is observe last season and try to emulate it and then try to surpass it. So uh, I'm sure every team, every team's undefeated in the off season, right? But this is, this is a year where Michigan is excited. And then there isn't that kind of, uh, existential dread from the fans that, oh, maybe it's it's going to be another season full of disappointment. So there's a little more optimism this year. It's amazing. You mentioned the existential dread right there. And, and actually, before we dive into a lot of the, the position battles and what the offense and defense are going to look like in 2022, you mentioned Jim Harbaugh. And I, I, I'm very curious about this. Now, it seems like there's a lot less pressure on the head coach going into this fall because he finally did beat Ohio State. He finally did win a Big Ten title and got to the college football playoff. Now, Again, he mentioned the, the goals in Big Ten media days is to beat Ohio State, Michigan State, and win the Big Ten all in one season. But do you feel like there's a, lot, there's a huge weight lifted off of Jim Harbaugh's shoulders going into September? Yeah, I think, I think he gets to go into this season doing it his way. People aren't questioning every single unique thing. I mean, people are still questioning him because he's Jim Harbaugh, and it seems like everything he does is a, is a national headline. But it seems like you know the, the method to his madness – uh, he gets a little bit more benefit of the doubt, at least from Michigan ants, where, you know, say he if he says this is the best wide receiver room he's ever had, uh, there's actually people actually believe him because it's, it, you know, he showed last season that, that when he sees a team that, that is really special and is capable of something, uh, he can actually deliver it in terms of his coaching. So, um, you know, he, he'll never give you the, the benefit or dignify your question about whether there's a weight off his shoulder, but it, it does seem like he's he's really comfortable with the culture with the development, with with the underclassmen kind of growing into uh, the leadership traits that the upperclassmen left behind last season. So, uh, you know, don't know how he's feeling personally, but it does seem like he's got a lot more confidence and it does seem like he gets a lot more trust from Michigan fans so far. And based on that, on that answer, it seems like the NFL thing in the offseason where he was in the running for the Minnesota Vikings job, that seems to be well behind everybody now, including Harbaugh and all the players and maybe perhaps the administration as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, it's I, I certainly can't, as someone who's cynical and has seen uh, the way college football is and really pro sports are these days, I, I can't say he's going to be at Michigan forever. And, and they have to answer this question on the recruiting trail. You ask any of our recruiting reporters, they'll say, I mean, other teams are, are using that as a negative recruiting tool. So I uh, can't say it's gone, but in terms no fans aren't mad at him. Players aren't mad at him. Uh, in fact, you know, a lot of the players were excited they're like we want to go to the NFL too so you know it's certainly something that they support him for so as far as the fan base and the players and the administration I don't think there's any uh, ill will toward him for looking uh, it's just a matter of continuing to produce and and recruit and produce on the field that's really uh, what he's paid for and that's that's what he's going to try to do this fall so Jim Harbaugh's specialty is the quarterback position, being a quarter, former quarterback himself. But, of course, everyone wants to know what is going yeah. on between Cade McNamara and J.J. McCarthy. This has been a quarterback battle ever since, basically since McCarthy came onto campus last year. He had some t uh, playing time last year, obviously scored the, the touchdown in the Big Ten championship game. But this is Cade McNamara's team, and based on what I see from the outside looking in, it looks like it's going to be 
Cade McNamara's team, at least at first, and he's, he's part of my Big Ten quarterback rankings in terms of at least the projections right now. But how do you see this quarterback battle playing out? It does, and does anybody actually have an edge quite yet as we are now just, what, three, four weeks away from week one? Yeah, not not yet. You know, Jim Harbaugh, he compared it to a, to a 10K run where, you know, you're in lap two or whatever, and there, you know, one guy will be ahead, but then the other guy, you know, five quick strides and he's right there. So it, it does seem like this is more so than in past years because Michigan always likes to do a quarterback battle. But I think this is a year where Michigan doesn't even necessarily know who its starting quarterback will be and, and doesn't have a guess. I think J.J., you know, he had the, the shoulder – injury this this spring so he didn't really get to we don't we haven't seen too much of them going head to head uh since his true freshman season but I think he's got a very good chance I mean if you watch him play he seems like the better thrower he seems like the better runner uh and so I think a lot of Michigan fans actually think it's going to be J.J. McCarthy but I I think that um you know you, you might you're not wrong to suggest Caden McNamara as a starter Jim Harbaugh said he's he's going to start fall camp as a starter and then they'll each get equal reps and so um, it, it's going to come down to who moves the offense. It's not who has the best arm. Jim Harbaugh, you know, his 2020 season, they had a great armed quarterback and it, and it didn't work because the offense didn't move. The players didn't respond, uh, you know, to his leadership. And so Kate, Kate brings a lot of interesting angles to the table where he wins the offense scores. Even if it's, if it's not like the prettiest throw, he understands what the right throw is. He understands how to avoid a sack or how to keep, keep the offense moving, even if it's not the shot that, you know, the play was designed for the 20 yard shot downfield. And so um, it's going to be, it's going to be really interesting. And I think with Michigan's easy September schedule, I'm not even sure that it's going to be decided week one. I think this actually could be something where they, they kind of keep looking and keep seeing until, until someone emerges, because right now it's, it's extremely close. I think it's the closest uh, quarterback battle that, that Jim Harbaugh's had since he's, since he's arrived at Michigan and, and you talk to players, talk to coaches, talk to guys, people behind the scenes. Uh, they're really excited about it because I don't think – I think they feel like they can win with either quarterback. It's just a matter of is one of them going to create that separation and and consistently deliver in practice to the point where, where they have no reason or they, they can't afford to not start him because he's just that good. So So we'll see. For now, it's pretty close, though. And you actually basically just answered my next question and just one more on it, which was what? when is the timetable for a decision? I mean, I, I felt we were maybe never going to see a decision until maybe kickoff during week one. Right. But you just mentioned non-conference games could be used to evaluate this battle further. So are you saying that there you might not have an official start between McNamara and McCarthy till the Big Ten opener? Yeah, I, I think they'll name one of them a starter, but I don't think they're going to stop the other guy from playing. You know, they play Colorado State. Um, you know, week one, they have their first, first time they're not playing a power five team in non-conference since the seventies. If I'm the coaches, I'm using that as an opportunity to let both guys play a quarter, maybe, or let both guys play a couple series, you know, meaningful series too, not just handing the ball off and, and running out the clock because, uh, you know, as much as, as much as you want to see in practice, sometimes what you see in games is, is more valuable. So who's, who's actually producing for this offense, you know, Jim Harbaugh, he said the main stat's going to be percentage of drives that end in points, whether it's touchdowns or field goals. And so um, that's going to be a factor. You know, Matt Weiss uh, previously uh, was was instrumental in helping Baltimore Ravens quarterback room get as, as deep and talented as it is. You know, he, his thing is, is a lot. It's going to be a lot of fundamentals. It's going to be a lot of avoiding mistakes, but also continuing to progress as the season goes on. So I think it I think it could be open. That's, you know, that's not from Jim. That's my speculation, but they, they really have an opportunity. I think either quarterback has them starting three, and zero with ease. Um, and so if it still feels close come the end of August, well, maybe you just you let both of them have a shot all the way through uh, that month of September before the big games start. Boy, that's going to be fascinating. So one more on the offense here. And Blake Corm is back at running back. Donovan Edwards is also back in the backfield as well. But Jim Harbaugh mentioned that this is the best wide receiver group that he's had. And that's not verbatim, but it's one of the best he's had in recent memory. And, of course, they get Ronnie Bell back from injury as well. But he mentioned a few other guys. What's your biggest take on the rest of the offense with the running backs, which is still an elite group, and plus this now new-look group of wide receivers? Yeah, they have 11 scholarship wide receivers, which in today's college football, I'd be – I'd be curious how many teams can actually pull that off without someone saying, I, I'm out. You know, I don't want to be a fourth string wide receiver for this team. I want to go transfer somewhere where I can get a lot of targets, a lot of reps. And, and yeah, they bring back everybody but Dalen Baldwin. So they bring, you know, they add Ronnie Bell. Cornelius Johnson was the leading receiver last year. Roman Wilson, I thought, had a few great games down the stretch. And then 
And then Andrew Anthony, I think those four are kind of the guys who, who can compete for number one. Andrew Anthony had a great game against Michigan State. Quiet freshman season overall, but but just some of the ways he was able to make contested catches in the second half of last season. You just kind of, in the size and the speed that he has, he, I think all three have a really legitimate case to be the number one wide receiver. It's something, you know, Michigan fans have had long debates about. We've had it on our podcast and in our articles. You know, it's it could go in any direction. And then they've got, you know, a lot of specialty guys. Darius Clemens, great testing numbers. A.J. Henning. Uh, you know, he had that touchdown against Ohio State last fall, and it seems like every time he touches the ball, he could take it to the house with the speed and the elusiveness that he has. And then, you know, it doesn't always get talked about at every school, but tight ends. They have they have seven scholarship tight ends. They bring back every tight end from last season, including Eric All, someone that, that Michigan coaches think is one of the best tight ends in the country and, and probably probably has an NFL draft future if he continues his trajectory. He had uh, 400 30 yards last season and, and closed the season really averaging around 50 yards a game. So yeah, they've got a lot of guys to throw it to. Uh, I think, you know, that's, it's going to be very interesting to see how they, how they mix it up without specializing guys, without putting guys into, okay, when you're on the field, we're running this play. And so it's, it's going to be interesting one to see if someone steps up and is, is, you know, maybe an 800 yard uh, threat because it seems like they've got a lot of guys who can get 400 to 600 yards this fall. Um, but I'm sure Michigan is hoping that someone has stepped up and is, is one of the best in the country at their position. So lots of guys to throw to. And then, yeah, you mentioned Blake Corum, Donovan Edwards. Um, we've seen Corum. You know, he almost if, if he if it's on Haskins wasn't on the team last year, he probably runs for twelve hundred plus yards. It's probably viewed in the same breath as, as Ohio State's Travion Henderson. He, he can do the big plays. He can run up the middle. He can catch passes. Uh, really elusive guy. Good testing times. And then Donovan Edwards, former five-star recruit, uh, catches the ball like a wide receiver. You, know, you look, look at the degree of difficulty on his catches last fall. You know, he's he's a special, you know, Jim Harbaugh called him a once-in-a-generation kind of talent in terms of his versatility on offense. He threw a 75-yard touchdown pass in the Big Ten title game. Um, so he's someone that, you know, they've, they've got a lot of ways they can be creative. They've got a lot of different players they can put in different positions. You know, A.J. Henning can line up in the backfield. Uh, they've got tight ends that can line up in the slot. I mean, they they can be really creative. And and uh, you know, Matt Weiss, the offensive coordinator, called it an embarrassment of riches. And so now it just depends on how how far they can take that. You know, how creative can they get? How aggressive will this offense be compared to last season, where it was really more just move the football? You know, can kind of control the pace, control the tempo. They've got they've got an opportunity to to be a really electric offense. And so I think the big thing will just be managing those snaps, seeing if who steps forward and then utilizing uh, the talent that you have to put the most points on the board as possible. Zach Shaw with me on the college football daily. Zach, got to ask you about the defense. And the biggest question probably is how do you replace Aiden Hutchinson and David Ojabo, both guys in the NFL now to elite pass rushers. That to me is probably the biggest question on the other side of the ball for Michigan. What's your take on that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really big. I mean, they were maybe two of the top four or five edge rushers in the country last season, and, and they're both gone. Um, and Michigan coaches, have they've been straight up. They're, you're not going to replace Aiden Hutchinson and David Ajabo, you know, one for one. N none of these edge rushing candidates are, are should could fairly be expected to do that. And so you try to replace it with an overall improved defensive front, defensive pass rush. You know, on the inside, Mozzie Smith returns. He, he, he had a very strong finish to last season. Chris Jenkins did as well to the point where he was – he was almost a de facto starter as a redshirt freshman. It, you know, those are two guys on the interior that can be really successful. And then on the edge, I mean, they have size, they have strength, they have guys who were who were talented recruits. You know, Mike Morris is someone uh, six seven, long armed. You know, he can kind of play inside and outside. He's got some good weight to him. Uh, Julius Welshoff, similar size, similar frame to Morris, and and he's got really good testing times. You know, four six eight forty yard dash, ten foot uh, five inch broad jump. So those are two guys who I think can really um, allow them to play NFL style, where you know, maybe one of your edge rushers is big and, and you know 275 plus pounds and, and can really uh, hard hard guy to move, but then can still get into the backfield uh, when when time comes. And then and then they've got some intriguing guys. Taylor Upshaw um, quietly very productive as a pass rusher last season. I think the only reason people don't know his name is because they had Aiden Hutchinson and David Ajabo. You know, you look at his efficiency when he was out there. He was he was very good at getting to the quarterback. Um, Jalen Harrell, quietly, you know, I, I don't think it gets said enough. He played more snaps than Ajabo did in the Orange Bowl. 
So that speaks to the trajectory he's had and, and his ability to stop the run. He's a he's great at reading, you know, run option plays and, and stopping, uh, you know, rushers in the, in their tracks. And so, you know, Jim Harbaugh and, and other coaches have said this, that I, they can't replace Aiden Hutchinson. They can't replace David Ajabo, but can they have a better defensive front, a better, uh, you know, are they better at stopping the run? Are they better at getting to the quarterback this season? They think there's still potential for that. And I think the key is just understanding that it's going to be depth. It's going to be you replace that production with five or six players. That's actually a lot more doable than expecting someone to come in and get 15 sacks like Aiden Hutchinson. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a loss. Every, every college football team has this. They lose star players, and then you try your best to replace them. And I think Michigan's kind of doing the – communal approach to replacing those two, at least on the defensive line. Zach, I'll get you out of here on this one. It's more, it's kind of a two-part question here, but I'm looking at Michigan as a whole and based on the predictions I put out for the Big Ten uh, across the board, I have them at 11-1, and one, losing to Ohio State and probably maybe sneaking into the college football playoff if things break right or you get to an elite bowl game as well. So two-part here for you. Where do you see this team finishing in 2022 before we even hit September and how does this team match up with Ohio State? And basically, it goes hand in hand. If they can beat Ohio State, I would imagine you're probably going to say a repeat of the Big Ten title for the for the Michigan Wolverines this year. Yeah, I'm I'm toying with that eleven to eleven and one. Um, it's it's a lot to ask, you know, with all the different players that they're replacing. But the schedule does break really nicely for them. They get Michigan State and Penn State at home. Um, they play at Iowa. That's that's going to be that's no easy place to play. Uh, very good Michigan teams have have had their national title hopes ruined at Kinnick. But at the same time, they the way they beat Iowa um, just in back in December makes me wonder if, if you know, they, they really can get to that Ohio State game 11-0. I do not see them stacking up well against Ohio State at this stage. There's, there's too many questions for Michigan and, and too many answers that are already there for Ohio State, you know, with the offensive firepower they're returning. Um, they have their own questions to address, but I think Michigan – you know, I, I think I want to see what this defense looks like, see what this this pass rush looks like, because as much as the the ground game was successful against Ohio State last fall, um, I think Ohio State's offense is going to be better, and I think they're going to be better prepared for Michigan this time around. And so I think it's going to be – they're going to have to be able to put a lot of points on the board or really get to C.J. Stroud, really put pressure on him. So as of right now, I'm, I'm kind of with you, 11-1. Um, and one, I think there's a chance they, they drop – you know, either to Michigan State, Penn State, or, or Iowa. It's just it's just hard to go three and zero against those those three teams in in a span of four or five weeks. Um, but I'm I'm sitting around eleven and one, and and I think I think Michigan's got the talent to uh, to meet all of their goals. And so it's just a matter of you know, filling out those those little question marks here and there, or these these weak points that that you know departing players left behind. Um, but the talent is there. You know, I saw they were they were number six this week in the coaches poll. Um, I think that's that's a foundation that they can work with. No doubt, and hopefully we are sitting here in November around Thanksgiving weekend. Just for the drama, 11-0 and Ohio State yes. and 11-0 and Michigan, that would be quite the epic theater right there. Zach Shaw joining me on the College Football Daily from the Michigan Insider. Be sure to follow him on Twitter. Be sure to give a follow to our Michigan coverage as well at 247sports.com. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe this show on youtube as well and of course wherever you get your podcast spotify apple wherever the case may be zach one more here where can people follow you on social media yeah underscore zach shaw on twitter um that's that's my main social media so it's it's busy this time of year though lots lots of updates from fall camp and everything best the best michigan coverage you can get anywhere right here on 24 7 sports zach appreciate the time as always for Zach Shaw, I am Nick Costco saying so long. This has been the College Football Daily on 24-7 Sports.